Hello Year 12, we're back and today we're looking at infrared spectroscopy, so let's get started. So to begin with, infrared spectroscopy is a technique that's used to determine the structure of organic compounds by identifying their functional groups. And essentially how this works is it looks at the different covalent bonds in the compound and you get peaks for each one of those covalent bonds. And it's your job to be able to recognize which peaks correspond to which bonds. And if you know which bonds it contains, then you know which functional groups it contains. And then by combining that with other data, you might be able to determine the structure of that compound. So let's have a look at how infrared spectroscopy works. Well, the first thing you're going to need is an infrared spectrometer. It's about two microwaves in size. They look a little bit like this. Used plenty of those in my uni days as well. This one's got a little clamp where you actually clamp the sample down onto this little metal plate here um, on top of a crystal, actually. Um, but in general, the main features that infrared spectrometers have are a transmitter and a detector. And that transmitter is going to transmit infrared radiation and the detector is going to detect that infrared radiation. Now, the transmitter is going to transmit it at a range of different frequencies and hopefully your detector would detect all of those, right? But we've got this little gap in the middle here where you could put a sample and given what covalent bonds your sample might have in each compound within it, uh, then you may have different absorptions, meaning the detector doesn't get all of it. But imagining that this gap is empty here, then you would get 100% transmittance um, with an empty infrared spectrometer, as long as there's nothing in that gap. So now let's imagine if we put a sample in there, well, that sample will contain compounds with specific covalent bonds. So some of those, some of that infrared radiation's frequencies would have been absorbed by the sample and therefore would have never reached the detector. So if we actually look at our transmittance response now, we can see that frequencies maybe in this 2,000 to 500, uh, 2,500 to 3,000 range were absorbed by the sample. So you can see that the value for transmittance here is much lower. You might notice as well a couple of interesting features about this graph that we call a spectrum, an infrared spectrum to be precise. The peaks are actually going down like this and also the x-axis is going from largest to smallest. Um, now that's actually not true um, because of the units of the x-axis. The units of the x-axis are wave number um, which is one over the wavelength and because of that this is actually a much smaller number than this number over here. OK, so you can see we've got a peak here. As I said, it's 2,500 to 3,000 centimetres to the minus one. OK, well, so that's one over the wavelength in centimetres. And um, that's because some compound in our, in our sample has a bond within it that's absorbed within that region. OK, and that actually happens to be the OH bond of a carboxylic acid. We've also got another absorption here of, um, we can say it's a sharper peak between um, 1,680 and 1,750. And that in particular corresponds to a carbonyl, okay? So a C double bond O. So as I said, these are bonds within our sample that are absorbing infrared radiation of that particular frequency. And as a result of that, the transmittance, the amount of infrared radiation within that range that reaches the detector is much lower. Okay, so from this information, we would be able to infer that we have the OH, which belongs to a carboxylic acid because it's in the correct range for a carboxylic acid, and we've got a carbonyl. Put them together, we've got a carboxylic acid. Okay, so let's actually have a look at what's going on here. How is it that those bonds are absorbing that infrared radiation? Well, essentially, when we transmit the infrared radiation through the sample, what it does is it causes the bonds to vibrate, the covalent bonds to be specific. OK, so the covalent bonds within this sample are absorbing the infrared radiation. And what we can say is it's increasing their vibrational energy, OK, increasing their vibrational energy. And because specific bonds absorb specific frequencies, then you would know based on what's been absorbed, what bonds you're looking at. But let's say, for example, this carbonyl bond here. Um, well, it's not always going to absorb exactly the same frequency. That will depend on where the carbonyl is in the molecule, what it's surrounded by. OH, for example, as well. It depends on where it is. If it's the OH of an alcohol, it absorbs slightly differently to the OH of a carboxylic acid. OK, let's have a look then at what data you get provided with. Um, I've uploaded this as an attachment if you're one of my students on Google Classroom, but you get this infrared absorption data table on, your, on the back of your periodic table, essentially, when you go into the exam. And what we can see here is the ranges for where you would expect to see the peaks 
um, for all of these different covalent bonds. So the NH of an amine, this range here, and so on and so forth. So you can see we'd get these absorptions for these specific covalent bonds. Again, notice how the alcohol OH and the carboxylic acid OH has a slightly different range. Although they're the same covalent bond, it depends on the environment they're in as to where we would get the peak. So let's have a look at what the infrared spectrum simplified would look like for an alcohol. I would argue that the key defining characteristics of an alcohol in terms of its covalent bonds are first the OH, which we would expect to be somewhere around here, 3,230 to 3,550. Notice how I went for the OH of an alcohol and not the OH of an acid. And the second bond that may help us identify an alcohol is this C to O bond here. Um, now it's not as helpful because it's actually within a region that we call the fingerprint region. So the OH is the best indicator of an alcohol, um, but we do have this bond as well that's unique to alcohols. So that would be expected in 1000 to 1300 uh, centimeters to the minus one. Okay, so this is what then our infrared spectrum in a simplified way would look like. There's our peak for the alcohol here in blue in about the correct range. And there's our peak for the C single bond O in around the correct range there. Now, if we were describing this infrared spectrum, we'd need to say the following. We've got a broad peak at 3,230 to 3,550, which corresponds to the OH bond of an alcohol, defining the bond, showing the actual bond there in my writing as well. Um, this one here, I'd say this is a, it's not broad, it's a little bit sharper as you can see. So we've got a peak here at 1,200, corresponding to the C single bond O of the alcohol. That's how we'd word it. Let's have a look now at carboxylic acid. So again, characteristic bonds of a carboxylic acid. Well, I've got my OH. However, this time it's gonna be the OH in this region here. Okay, I've got my C single bond O over here. I've got my carbonyl here. So let's have a look at what the infrared spectrum would look like. Okay, so there we go. There's our OH. As you can see, it's shifted down a little bit now um, because this is the OH of an acid. It previously was up here for the alcohol. It's a little bit further down, nice and broad. Okay, we've got the carbonyl there of the carboxylic acid and we've got the C single bond O. Okay, so we've got a broad peak at 2,500 to 3,000 corresponding to the OH of a carboxylic acid. The peak at 1690 is within that range there, corresponds to the C double bond O or the carbonyl of the carboxylic acid. Again, I'm stating the bonds here. You've got to do that. You've got to show the bond you're talking about. And then finally, the one for the C single bond O. Okay, right then, let's move on. Okay, so what I wanna do quickly is give you some tips. And those tips are as follows. If it's a broad peak, state the range. So this one's a broad peak, so I'm stating the range. If it's a sharper peak, just give the exact value from the graph. So where it touches uh, the graph there, like that. So exact values for these ones, because they're quite sharp but broader ones give a range, okay? The only real broad ones you'll come across are likely to be the OHs, NHs, things like that, okay? Always write the bond in your explanation. So here's an example of a rubbish explanation, talking about this peak here. The peak at 1,690 corresponds to a carboxylic acid. Not really, it corresponds to a carbonyl. So this would be a better response. It corresponds to the C double bond O of a carboxylic acid. State the bond you're talking about, don't just state the functional group. Okay, let's have a look at what we'd expect for ketones and aldehydes now then. So the defining bond of both of these really is the C double bond O or the carbonyl. And both of those would be in the same range. So a simplified infrared spectrum for these would look a little bit like this. Okay, so there we can see we've got a peak at 1690 corresponding to the carbonyl bond of the ketone or aldehyde. Notice how you might struggle to differentiate between a ketone and an aldehyde uh, as they both contain the same covalent bond really as their defining characteristic. So it's gonna be difficult to determine between those two, but obviously you could use Tollens, Tollens reagent or Felling solution in order to distinguish between those two chemically uh, rather than just a spectroscopic analysis like this one. Okay, let's have a look at an ester now. Uh, so an ester's defining functional uh, functionality or covalent bonds. We've got the C single bond O, which we'd expect in this range. We've got the C double bond O, which we'd expect in this range. Okay, so that's what our infrared spectrum would look like, and that's how we'd word it. Okay, right then. Let's have a look at this one then. So this time we've got exactly the same bonds that you would expect to see in a carboxylic acid, right? You've got an OH, you've got a C single bond O, and you've got a C double bond O, carbonyl, okay? 
okay? So you've got all three of these bonds, but this is not a carboxylic acid. Now, actually, the way we would know that this wasn't a carboxylic acid from the infrared spectrum uh, is because the OH would actually be the OH of an alcohol as opposed to being the OH of an acid. So you've got to pay very careful attention to the ranges at which they're in in order to make sure you wouldn't get the spectra for this one, um, spectrum for this one, sorry, mixed up with that of a carboxylic acid, okay? Because it's an alcohol, this OH is shifted to the left a little bit, whereas if it was an acid, it would be shifted to the right a little bit. Okay, there's our wording there for explaining that. Okay, so this is a little bit more what an infrared spectrum would look like. All the examples I've showed you before this are completely oversimplified, so not realistic to be um, what you would see certainly in an exam or on a real infrared spectrum. Okay, um, so this is a little bit more what they look like in reality. So you can see we've got this big broad peak up here. That tends to be an OH. If it's this side of 3000, it could be one type of OH. If it's this side, it could be the other type. That's your definitely a carbonyl there by the looks of things, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, one of the bonds that I've missed out a lot on these, are well, two bonds that I've missed out, um, are certainly the CH and the CC bonds. The reason I've missed these two out is that they feature in almost every single infrared spectrum, but they're not particularly good at characterizing your compound because almost every organic compound you're going to look at has got a CC single bond and a CH bond. So they're not they're, because they're not unique to any particular functional group, I've not bothered really to go through them much because they're not going to tell you what the compound is. Um, now, there is a part of the infrared spectrum as well, which gets a little bit complicated, and it's this region um, here, okay? This region between 1,000 and 1,550. You do need to know that range, by the way. We call this the fingerprint region. And actually, every different organic compound, or compound in general, to be precise, is going to have a fingerprint region that's completely unique to that specific compound, not just its functionality. So methanol and ethanol would have a completely different fingerprint region. There might be some features in common, uh, but their fingerprint regions would be quite different. Okay. So what you can actually do is if you've got a database of known substances, then you can compare the fingerprint region with that. Okay. Now, finally, I want to look at how this links to global warming. OK, now, key idea, the sun emits UV shortwave radiation, and that's absorbed by the Earth's surface and re-emitted as infrared longwave radiation. And that's actually the process by which Earth heats up and cools down. UV shortwave radiation hitting the Earth heats the Earth's surface up, and then the Earth re-emits it as that infrared longwave, which normally travels back out into space and is re-emitted. Well, actually, um, if you've got greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, water vapour, carbon dioxide and methane, carbon dioxide being the key one for this, um, then what can actually happen is that the covalent bonds, particularly this carbonyl bond, the C double bond O of carbon dioxide, that covalent bond there can absorb the long wave infrared radiation. And that stops it being re-emitted back out into space because it's absorbed as uh, by increasing the vibrational energy of that CO double bond. Um, and therefore, it doesn't actually re-emit back out into space. It stays into the in the atmosphere and Earth's atmosphere warms up. OK, so to finish off then, guys, we've got some review questions. You can see uh, those questions here on your screen. If you want to pause the video right now and then start uploading your answers to your Google Doc, then if you come back and um, have a little flick through and we'll start going through those answers now. OK, then. Right. So what is infrared spectroscopy used for? Uh, determining the structure of compounds by identifying their functional groups. How does it work? First of all, we transmit infrared radiation through the sample towards a detector. Specific covalent bonds in the sample absorb the infrared radiation of specific frequencies, and this increases their vibrational energy. Then the detector records the absence of specific frequencies as lower transmittance, and that infers that those particular frequencies have been absorbed, and then we can link the specific frequencies absorbed to particular covalent bonds. What are the y and x-axis of an infrared spectrum? The y-axis is transmittance or percentage transmittance, and the x-axis is wave number, which is one divided by the wavelength. Next up, suggest the ranges of three peaks you'd likely to see for carboxylic, uh, carboxylic acids infrared spectrum, and in each case, state the bonds responsible for each peak. We would expect the OH of an acid between 2,500 and 3,000. We'd expect the uh, carbonyl C double bond O between 1,680 and 1,750. We'd expect a C single bond O between 1,000 and 1,300 there. Bang in the fingerprint region, though, that one. Okay. 
range of the major peak we'd see for a ketone or an aldehyde, well, you'd get a carbonyl C double bond O. Always write the bond down, as I've done here with these, between 1,680 and 1,750. Suggest the ranges of two peaks you'd see for an alcohol IR spectrum, and in each case, state the bonds responsible. OH, but this time, though, between 3,250 and 3,550, because the OH is in an alcohol environment, not in a carboxylic acid environment. And 1,000 to 1,300 there for the C single bond O. Three peaks we would see for something that's got both the aldehyde functional group and the alcohol. Let's have a look. Okay, so we'd expect the OH of an alcohol in this range here, and we'd expect the carbonyl C double bond O in that range there. What peaks in almost every organic infrared spectrum that I drew uh, has been removed from my oversimplified examples? I removed the CH and the CC bonds there. Okay. What's the range for the fingerprint region and what's it used for? 1,000 to 1,550, and it's unique infrared absorption to the specific compound. How's it related to global warming? Well, oh, sorry, last one. Compare it with a database of known substances in order to identify. That's what it's used for. Okay, so remember, short wave UV comes from the sun, passes through Earth's atmosphere. Short wave UV is absorbed by the surface of the Earth, warming it up re-emits that heat back out as long-wave infrared radiation cooling the Earth back down. Covalent bonds in greenhouse gases, particularly the carbonyl of carbon dioxide, absorbs it and um, traps the heat in the Earth's atmosphere, so it warms it up. Okay, right, so we're done for today. Thanks very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.